Now, many of us have this issue where when we go to the secret place, we allow our flesh to throw a fit and tell us to leave. You ever notice that you can sing and worship for an hour, be moved and not have any trouble with standing there for an hour? You can hear the word expounded upon, and if someone is speaking with eloquence and depth, you're drawn to what they are saying because there's a richness to the word, and you receive of that without any complaints. You can serve in a ministry, you can serve in an orphanage, you can serve in a feeding project, and there'll be no issue there. But notice then that the moment you go to pray, the flesh starts to squirm. And the reason the flesh begins to squirm when you go to pray is because prayer is the death of the flesh. Prayer is how you grab that other person who you call the flesh, you grab them by the back of the neck and force them into subjection and tell them to stay put, to lose strength. Stay there, not come and go, dwell, abide. Now go to Philippians chapter four. I wanna show you something. This is powerful. It's, of course, any, anything and everything in the word of God is powerful, but certain things just stand out in certain seasons, don't they? So let me show you something in Philippians chapter four. Verses 6 and 7, you've likely read this portion of Scripture several times, but this astounded me here. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. That right there in and of itself is a life-changing statement. Don't worry about anything. Why? Because what did Jesus say? Worry does nothing for you. Worry doesn't cause anything to happen or to not happen. Worry is a useless attempt at control. Worry is how your flesh prays. Worry is the flesh's powerless counterfeit for prayer. So don't worry about anything. In other words, try to control it. Try to understand it. Try to cause this to not happen or to happen or force it or fight it. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Here the scripture makes it clear that you can make requests of God while still being grateful. Never mind with this lack mentality that tells you that you cannot pray for a miracle in your job or in your resources or in your health because someone else is suffering. Who is saying that God is running out of miracles? I remember one time I was ministering in Chicago and there was a woman sitting right on the front row. She had a cane. She obviously needed healing. It didn't take a word of knowledge to see that. And I said, ma'am, can I pray for you? She said, no. Are you? And I said, are you sure? She said, absolutely not. And then I got curious. So I said, well, why not? She says, well, I want you to pray for everyone else. Very dramatic about it, you know. Pray for everyone else. Let me sit here and suffer on the front row because I want them to receive their miracle. I want God to touch them and not have to worry about me. Now, I was younger then. I'm still young now. Thank you, Jesus. You can say amen. I was younger then, so I wasn't as, uh, well, you know, I wasn't as filtered as I am now. And so my first response was to say, well, ma'am, Jesus isn't running out of miracles. Now, I shouldn't have said that like that. It was a little bit sarcastic, but she gets up, leaves the service, and that's how some of us think. We have this mentality that God only has a certain amount of miracle-working power and that if I get something over here, then someone else has to have something taken over there. And I promise you, the Father does not mind your request, but it is a matter of prioritization. It's okay to have blessings as long as blessings don't have you. Now here you can do both. Tell God what you need. Lord, this is what I need. And don't confuse needs for wants. Lord, this is what I need. This is what I'm asking. This is what I'm praying for. And at the same time, you can still thank him. So you can be grateful while also asking God, making your request known to him. Now this is where I want to put things into perspective because this is where many believers become confused. Look at verse 7. Then you will experience God's peace when... Then, then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Now, this is important to understand because it is, it is really a powerful key to prayer and going into the depths of the Holy Spirit. When I, when I say that, I don't mean that you're literally going somewhere or that you don't already have the Holy Spirit. You have the Holy Spirit. When I say that, I mean your awareness of and ability to receive from that which God has already deposited in you. So God has already put the Holy Spirit in you. You have that power. It's a matter now of tapping into that, surrendering in a way that will cause you to receive from that. Now, I am not 
an outdoors type person. My idea of camping involves a bed, maybe some AC, <laughs> maybe go look at the wilderness and then check back into the hotel. I just, I don't think I would survive out there. I was born in a generation where cell phones were introduced and this is just not me. So I'm not really what you would call, as they say, a mountain man. But when it comes to the spirit, I want to be a man of the mountain. When it comes to the spirit, you should want to be a woman of the mountain. You should want to be people of the mountain, mountaintop Christians. But here's the problem. Many of us, we, 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 we try to ascend the mountain burdened. It's like we go to the base of the mountain. God says, come up here. Come receive. Come be aware of. Come enjoy. He sends out this royal invitation. Psalm chapter 80, verse 18. Quicken us and we will call unto you. He quickens you, and then you call. And when God calls us, many of us grab our worries, our cares, our responsibilities, and we throw it over our shoulder like a backpack. And we try to make the climb. You can make the climb. It'll just take you longer. You'll eventually find that well from which you can drink. It'll just take you longer to dig it. And we, and we take that backpack, we sling it over the shoulder, and we begin to make that ascent in prayer. And then the flesh is fighting you. That's all that baggage. You're praying, you're praying, you're praying, and thoughts are rushing through your mind. Did I remember to purchase what I needed to purchase? Did I remember to pay that bill? Is so-and-so angry with me? Am I forgetting something on the schedule? Was there a phone call that I missed? What if I get sick? What if something bad happens to me? What if I lose my job? God, I don't feel you. Are you angry with me? Did I make you upset? Am I praying wrong? Am I praying correctly? Can I stand when I pray? Do I sit when I pray? Can I pace when I pray? When do I make my requests known? When do I do intercession? When do I pray in tongues? Can I pray in my mind or do I have to speak aloud? And for that matter, can I pray in tongues in my mind? And our mind just goes everywhere. <laughs> Chaos. This flow of thoughts and emotions. And before you know it, 20 minutes has passed and you weren't even praying. You sling that trouble over the shoulder, walking up the mountain, burdened by those things of this earth. And here the Bible says, tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done then you will experience peace. And we say things like, well, I was perfectly at peace until I went to pray. And then when I went to pray, suddenly those thoughts came, those emotions came, maybe worry about the future, shame from the past, questions and doubts for the present. There's enough to distract you for hours upon end. And we say that that didn't show up till I began to pray. No, my friend. It's not that that showed up when you went to pray. It's that it was revealed when you went to pray. You were just never quiet enough to hear what's going on inside of you. Well, no wonder Christians are walking around with depression. No wonder Christians are walking around with anxiety. No wonder Christians are walking around in confusion and fear and torment. All of these things we allow to clutter the mind and heart when God has called us to leave those cares behind to ascend the mountain. I'm not saying be naive. I'm not saying the responsibilities go away. I'm not saying there isn't something practical you still have to do in order to meet those responsibilities. I'm saying that when you ascend the mountain of God, you can give him your burdens. And when you give him those burdens, the peace fills you. So here's what happens. We go to pray, we're burdened, there's turmoil and thought patterns and doubts, just like a swirl of thoughts and emotions. And then we give him the burden, we take off the backpack and we hand it to him. That is the prayer request. Here you go, Lord. He takes those things and oh, the peace of God fills our hearts. And we say, I feel much better. Thank you, Lord. I'll see you tomorrow. And we walk right out.
But wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Why do we leave then? Stay there. You see, once the burden has been removed, that's not the conclusion of prayer. It's the beginning. Because now the distractions are gone. Now the chaos is gone. Now you've let down the backpack and you can begin to walk up the mountaintop. And so, he says, come up here. Peace precedes revelation. When I abide, I receive revelation. Verse 13 now of Exodus 24, please. So Moses and his assistant Joshua set out, and Moses climbed the mountain of God. He climbed. Now God, of course, could have teleported him. And there's this actually this very interesting theory. I'm not going to call it a doctrine because it's just speculation, but it's interesting nonetheless that Moses and Elisha, who had mountaintop experiences and both appeared at the transfiguration of Christ, were connected to that moment through God's power to time travel. Interesting thought. Don't take that to your, your theology professor and use it as a, your, your, your test paper or anything like that. It's just an interesting thought. But, but the point is, God could have, if he wanted to, just teleported Moses up to the top of the mountain. Come up here, and Moses had to climb. There is a practical side to experiencing the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. I'm not saying that it's a formula and that there's something that we can do to cause God to move. I'm saying that we build the altar, God sends the fire. Think about the Levitical priests, Levites. God tells them, keep the fire burning, don't ever let it go out. But God never told them to start the fire. He says, you steward the flame, and that fire came forth from the presence of the Lord. That fire came from heaven. And so the priests stewarded what God started. Prayer is partnership with God. You have to make the decision to pray. People come to me all the time asking, how do I pray more? You have to choose to pray more. <laughs> How do I pray consistently? You have to choose to pray consistently. I can't lay hands on someone and impart discipline. We can't pray you out of disobedience. You've got to decide. The Holy Spirit will give you desire to pray. You must enact the discipline to pray. He gives you those desires. The spirit is willing, the scripture says, but the flesh is weak. In other words, the spirit desires to pray. The flesh desires to scroll. The spirit desires to pray. The flesh says just one more episode. The spirit desires to pray. The flesh desires to go through the phone. The spirit desires to pray. The flesh says tomorrow we need more rest. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And my friend, we must learn to respond to the invitations of the Holy Spirit when he speaks. Don't tell me you can't hear from the Holy Spirit when you're caught up on your latest Netflix series. Don't tell me you can't hear from the Holy Spirit when you've watched YouTube videos for hours on end. This one's okay, keep watching. Don't tell me you don't have time to hear from the Holy Spirit just because you've been scrolling through Instagram or Facebook. Just look at the time that's been consumed on your phone and in interactions that aren't fruitful in any way. I'm not saying you can't do these things or have these things. I'm talking about prioritization and discipline. And we must make that decision to say no sometimes to the earthly so that we can say yes to the heavenly. It's the discipline of disconnect. He climbed the mountain. He did his part. Verse 14, Moses told the elders, stay here and wait for us until we come back. Aaron and her are here with you. If anyone has a dispute while I'm gone, consult with them. In other words, he told those around him, I cannot be disturbed. Let me say something that may offend some, but others will get this. 
When you ascend to the heights of the glory of God, and I'm not saying for your glory, I'm saying in that we've been so privileged as to be invited in. When you go to deeper depths and higher heights, not everyone can go with you. When you get saved, you lose some of your unsaved friends. Not because you think you're better than them, but because they don't want anything to do with you anymore. But when you begin to go deeper with God, you lose some lukewarm Christian friends too. Why? Because your fire convicts them about their cold heart. The holiness you're walking in convicts them about their compromise. And often I find that people who live in compromise will label the holy as legalistic when really what they're saying is, I don't want to obey God really. And again, it's not that we say, I'm better than you. I'm it's that they don't want to be around it. People who walk with God in this way often walk into rooms and the conversation changes. The, you know you're walking with God when you walk into a room. People go, quiet, quiet, quiet. There they are. Just be, don't, don't say anything. <laughs> you know you're walking with God when somebody cusses in front of you and says, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> the presence of the Holy Ghost on you. People can sense the beauty of his nearness. And so when you begin to ascend, you're going to have to recognize that not everyone will go there and not everyone will understand. Not everyone's going to understand why you pray. Not everyone's going to understand why you won't go certain places or do certain things or have certain conversations or associations or even the appearance of these things. We live for the audience of one. We live to please God the Father. And if God be for us, who can be against us? Verse 15. And I love this. Then Moses climbed up the mountain, and the cloud covered it. There we see that partnership in full effect. Moses climbed, God covered. And the glory of the Lord settled down on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it for six days. On the seventh day, the Lord called to Moses from inside the cloud. No one else heard that call but Moses. When you begin to walk with the Holy Spirit, you will inevitably step into your calling. For all the messages and teachings we hear on the call of God, and I love them. I myself teach on these things because there are biblical principles that we can apply that, of course, are very helpful. But I think we complicate things, don't we? For all the preaching we hear on the call of God or ministry, I think sometimes we miss the focus. Because, my friend, if you walk with the Holy Spirit, if you step when he says to step, if you speak when he says to speak, if you move when he says to move, resist when he says to resist, you will inevitably fulfill the call of God for your life. The call of God, as large as a concept as that may seem, is not fulfilled in one big moment where you respond to a voice maybe that's splitting the sky. If that's a part of your testimony, wonderful. I believe in those kinds of encounters. But generally speaking, the call of God is found in daily obedience. Those little things that he speaks to you about. God, I want to cross the seas and preach the gospel. My friend, have you crossed the street to preach the gospel? I want to preach to the nations of the world. Do your family members know you're a Christian? Faithful in the little, trusted with more. So God begins to speak to him and call to him from within that encounter, from within that realm of glory, from on top of the mountain. That's the royal invitation. And this is where God is looking. God does not call someone because they are gifted or charismatic or good looking or they're eloquent or they're, they're funny or intelligent or educated. It's not a matter of how talented you are, how skilled you are, how connected you are. It's about how surrendered you are to the Holy Spirit. 
There is no limit to what God can do with a life surrendered to the Holy Spirit. And that is the key to walk with him, to love him, to know him, and leave the rest to him. It's none of my business what he does with me. Father, it's not even my life anymore. Lord, use my life. No, Lord, use this life. It's yours. Everything is yours. And, and whether I see the things I want to happen, happen or not, it's what you want to do with my life, Jesus. Now, don't get me wrong. You can approach God anytime you desire. But make no mistake that that desire comes from the Holy Spirit. God is looking for someone to use. God is looking for a yielded vessel. When God called Moses, he was tending sheep, or he was tending the flock of his father-in-law. When God called David, he was tending sheep. When God called the disciples, they were fishing. Some of them were. Prophets, patriarchs, disciples. He found them doing something. Like it or not, God does not anoint the lazy. Now, some might hear something else. Are you saying God doesn't save the lazy? No, he, he saves the lazy. Thank God for that. We're all works in progress. I'm talking about the call to the destiny that God has for you. When God calls someone, he finds them doing something. When God looks for someone upon which he can place that mantle. God does not look at your title. God does not look at how long you've been in church or in ministry. God does not look at how much you think you know about prayer or the word or spiritual warfare or demonology. God does not look at your family connections. Did you marry into a family with a great name? Or do you have a friend who is anointed and walking in ministry? Or were your parents used of God or your grandparents used of God? No, when God begins to look around the earth for someone to use, he doesn't necessarily look in the places we treat with the highest esteem. When God looks for someone to use, he looks in the prayer room. The power of the Holy Spirit is found in the presence of the Holy Spirit. That's the secret. That's the key. That's the big idea. People sometimes want these very specific instructions so that they can have a formula for the power of God coming upon their life. How much do you pray? Why keep track? I don't sit down with my Jessica and say, okay, date night tonight, we have I'm gonna, 45 minutes, we're going to eat dinner, then another 15 minutes, we're going to have a conversation, and then 20 minutes, I'm going to sing to you. We do it to God. And then we count the hours we've been praying. And then when God uses us, we give ourselves the credit because we prayed. And we have faith now in our prayer life instead of in God. We have faith in our faith instead of in Jesus. But Moses was called by God. To, to be entrusted with this revelation, to deliver this word because he spent time upon the mountain. Go down now to verse 18. I want to show you something else. Actually, let's start at verse 17. To the Israelites at the foot of the mountain, the glory of the Lord appeared at the summit like a consuming fire. Then Moses disappeared into the cloud. Can you feel that? Moses disappeared into the cloud as he climbed higher up the mountain. He remained on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. And coming back from that mountaintop experience, he had a revelation in hand for the people in the valley. Think of how Jesus came down from that mountain. I addressed it last night. Jesus came down from the mountain of his transfiguration and stumbled upon a scene where his disciples were unable to drive out a devil. Only those who spend time with God on the mountain 
can drive out devils in the valley. Here we see with Moses that he spends time with God on the mountain and comes down with a revelation for God's people. And ultimately, this is where it begins to lead because you disappear into that cloud. Your life is lost in him, hidden in him. Enoch walked with God and was not, for God took him. When I read that, I prayed, God, I want to be a was not too. I want to be an empty space through which your power and presence can move. I want to be a void through which heaven can enter earth. Lord, let my hands be your hands. Heal through them. Let my eyes be your eyes. See through them. Let my ears be your ears. I want to hear your voice. Let my feet be your feet. Take me where you want me to go. Let my being be your being. Let my heart beat as one with yours. Crucify my will and in its place resurrect your own. I don't want them to see me. You don't want them to see you. You want them to see Jesus. 2 Corinthians 3, 16 through 18, but whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. For the Lord is the Spirit, and wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. There we see that this fellowship with the Holy Spirit yields amazing results. That's the power of the Holy Ghost. Stop talking to me about how powerful devils are and start talking to me about how powerful the Holy Spirit is. People live their whole lives going from deliverance to deliverance. God didn't call you to go from deliverance to deliverance. God called you to go from glory to glory. God called you to ascend the heights of the mountain. You say, but the devil is attacking me. My friend, demons cannot swim in the depths of God. Higher heights mean that they cannot follow. When you walk in the glory of the Holy Spirit in this way, and I'm not talking about walking in perfection. God is my witness. I am not perfect. My friend, my staff, my wife could tell you very clearly, I am not perfect and I'm not implying that I am. What I am is trusting in God. Surrender to him according to his ability and grace. It's not us, it's him. But as we begin to do that, we step into that deliverance and many believers treat deliverance like it's a substance. Casually having those conversations. Well, I went for deliverance there and I got some. I'm about 40% delivered now. They got 80 demons out, 20 left, 80% is not bad. I'll go to the next thing. As if the Holy Spirit drove some out, withheld and said, not till you give me the name, come back next week. I don't care what spirit is coming against you. There's no spirit more powerful than the Holy Spirit. And he lives in you. And so you, you live in this realm, you live in this place of glory and, and the atmosphere begins to change and, 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 and the, the focus is taken off of self and you don't even realize, but chains are beginning to fall off. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is that liberty. And you begin to walk in that authority. You begin to recognize who you are. Where you step, God steps. When you walk into rooms, the presence and the glory of God walks in with you. When you step into rooms, the atmosphere changes. When you step into rooms, the sick are healed and demons begin to tremble. We teach things that magnify the power of the enemy and minimize the power of the Holy Ghost. And it is an insult to the power of the Holy Spirit. It's an insult to the Holy Spirit when we talk as if it's a struggle for the Holy Spirit to do these things for us. The Holy Spirit begins to do a work in you. Verse 18, so all of us who have had the veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. He is the source of light. I'm just a reflection. He is the source of light. You are just a reflection. So all of us who had that veil removed can see and reflect, meaning when we face him, we reflect him. When we face away, we no longer reflect him. And the Lord, who is spirit, makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. Things begin to transform within you when you begin to know this fellowship of the Holy Spirit. 2 Corinthians 13, 14 was one of the most transformative scriptures in my life because it caused me to recognize that the Holy Spirit could be known. My friend, when you walk in this way, you don't have to seek atmospheres. You become one. 
When you walk in this way, you don't have to follow signs. Signs follow you. Something begins to change about your person. There's this resting of the cloud of glory upon your life. And that's the power of God in you. The Holy Spirit will help you to pray with more power. Evangelize with more boldness. To resist sin with grace. To walk in holiness with more sincerity. To serve with more vitality. To worship with more adoration flowing from your heart. Many believers grow cold in that way because they don't receive of the Holy Spirit. They're giving of emotions. They're giving of the physical body by lifting their hands and waving and jumping. And there's nothing wrong with that. But that is not the source of your worship. When you live from that place of fellowship with the precious Holy Spirit, everything begins to change about you. Everything begins to become different. And I'm not saying that you'll never struggle or have troubles, but you begin to recognize that no matter what is happening around me, I've got victory within me. No matter what confusion is coming against me, I have peace within me. No matter how I might feel, maybe even in certain seasons rejected, I know I have the love of God, and I know I have that power, and I know I have that peace. You can walk in that way. You can step into this realm of closeness with the Holy Spirit. Help us win souls and empower Christians around the world. Become a monthly partner with David Diga Hernandez by signing up for our automatic giving plan at davidhernandezministries.com slash partner. You can also give a single gift by going to davidhernandezministries.com slash donate. Your support, single or monthly of any amount, will help us continue to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ all around the world in the power of the Holy Spirit. Get involved as we win this generation to the kingdom of God.